First off, I guess, is the background. Um, so if we look at the background of the game, it's, you know, it's kind of uh, abstract. Um, and I can zoom around here and you can see there's like, it looks a little bit like a watercolor uh, image or something. But yeah. if you notice, everything's animating. Yeah. Um, like these, these little squares are like fading in and out of view. Um, actually, if I go to a level that's from world one, maybe I'll just go to the world itself. Um, you can see like these cool, like nineties, like uh school binder <laughs> pattern mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, so you might think, uh, this is like a flip book animation, like literally like where I, I created this in some tool and exported the frames of it, you know, and I'm just like playing them back. But if you look closely, you realize that that would be a lot of frames um, right. and actually it parallaxes and things. So like there's different layers of depth um, and it's seamless and it tiles, uh, you know, and there's like the shapes are constantly moving and rotating and stuff. So this is actually a dynamic effect. Um, and uh, I was kind of thought it was kind of cool how I figured out how to make it work. So the basic yeah. idea is um, we have, let's see, I think it's in this scene here. Uh, I have two particle effects um, that are over off, off in the corner of the scene. So you can see like the level is way over here um, and they're on their own layer, but just to make it easier to lay things out, you know, they're, they're off on the side. Gotcha. And so there's two layers here. There's like these little dots um, and, the shapes. and the shapes. And if I let it play, you can see them animating here. Yeah. So yeah, I'm rendering those to texture. Uh, so I have two textures, you know, one that's transparent and just has the dots and one that's transparent and just has the like weird geometric shapes. And then those are used in a shader to be parallaxed and added some noise and stuff. So they look like watercolor because you can see right. here they're they're crisp shapes. They're not so, actually like they don't already look like watercolor. They're just sort of like nice little shapes. Yeah. Um, and then they they get sort of composited onto the screen with a paper texture and then the two layers and the watercolor effect. And then that's where the parallaxing can happen by choosing the UVs, you know, so that the UVs move at a different rate based on right. the way the camera moves. Um, but one problem with this is trying to make these seamless uh, because, you know, no matter where I crop that texture, there would be the edge where like, let's say for example, like this big bright green Cut object right half. here, it might be like just going right halfway off the edge of the texture. And so for it to be seamless, you need the other half on the on the other side of the texture, right? right? right. Um, and there's no like super easy way to do that. Um, so uh, rather, so I guess what I should say is me two years ago trying to make this effect would have been like, I don't know how to do that, but I can get it close. And so I'll, I'll do what I just showed you. I'll, and when I said render them to a texture, I must have a camera set up, you know, like yeah. an extra Unity camera set up. It's like just looking at the particles and maybe it's culling mask is set just to the particles and stuff, right? But I would still have that problem. And so then I would probably have to find some other solution, like maybe the texture like mirrors in the shader or something mm -hmm. to try and like, because right. when things get to the edge, they would very clearly be like collapsing in on themselves. And yes. This project, um, I learned about uh, other options for rendering that I actually didn't know much about previously, um, and that's using a command buffer. So if I go down here to this system, you can see this is where I actually draw into the texture. So I, I don't have a camera at all uh, to get those particles into a texture. Um, there's this thing called a command buffer, which is a way to just do some draw operations, use Unity's mechanisms to do draw operations, but outside of the automated way it happens when you have a camera. So basically you create a command buffer and then you set up a bunch of stuff <clears throat> and then you say execute. And this will go to the GPU and like do all the drawing that you requested. Yeah. And so a, that's a cheaper way mm -hmm. to draw this particle into a texture because a camera comes with some overhead just by existing. Yes. You know, it's like Unity's like, oh, you want a camera? We're going to, we got to do stuff with this. We're going to have to do the depth buffer and wait, where is it in the stack? Or, you know, is it, is it a standalone camera or what? And we got to do culling. Like what should we even show on the, you know, like there's just right. processing that has to happen that all makes sense you can just when bypass. it's a camera in the scene. Yeah. But here you don't do any of that. You just say, here's where this, you know, these, these are the two things that a camera normally does for you. It creates these uh, matrices that 
tell like where is the camera in relation to objects and like is it perspective or orthographic and stuff like that so that's a little you know uh, uh like daunting at first to be like i have to learn how to like set this stuff up that a camera would do for you but once you set that up that controls what's going to end up in the view of this render operation and then uh you say render this texture please and then ultimately i end up calling draw mesh and so you can just draw meshes manually whoa that's cool <clears throat> and then I realized I can make my texture seamless because I take the mesh of the particles and I draw it once centered and then I draw it eight more times offset like a tiling system. So like I slide it all the way over to the side and draw nice. it again and then slide it over here. And so most of that's off screen, but maybe a little bit of it is peeking in from the sides, okay, okay. which makes it perfectly seamless as long as all the math lines up, right? Like my texture is 10 units in unity space or whatever and so i slide these things over exactly 10 in each direction and then that means that i can have a dynamic particle system that perfectly tiles in all yeah. directions and i can do it pretty efficiently because i don't need 10 i don't need nine copies of the particle system you know i just have one particle system and i just like slide it over and render it nine times. And at this point, it just feels like a texture. Even though there's so much going on, it just feels like an image, right? Because you've already done all the work and, right. and layered it. And yeah, so the output yeah. of this is these two perfectly seamlessly tiling images that yeah. happen to be cool particle systems that I can yeah. then, um, you know, uh, uh, parallax and stuff into the game. And so one of the main ways I relatively cheaply from a development point of view, distinguish each world is simply by changing this background. You know, right. I, I do different particles, different color scheme, you know, and a few different properties and I can get it to feel fairly different. Although <clears throat> I actually, you gave me this feedback uh, when you played the game where you were like, world two looks too similar to world one. And in retrospect, I'm like, you're totally right. World <laughs> two looks way too similar to world one. And yeah. I started to get more adventurous with the later worlds, like okay. where they got more different colors and they had, they're a little more visually it's different. Yeah. Um, and so in retrospect, I probably should have made world two a little more like you are in a new place um, yeah but from a development point of view this was a great option for me because it's not a it's not a tremendous amount of effort to make a new background right but it feels pretty different you know i can get a pretty big difference in feel uh, for a relatively you know low amount of um, development effort or time spent on it so <laughs> that's kind of like the meat of the background Mm -hmm. And is it already when it's being played already at that 12 frame per second at the particle level or do you add that effect <clears throat> after oh yeah I, mean, I should mention yeah so because it's supposed to be a flipbook, anything in the game that's trying to feel like a flipbook, okay. I decided I should update at a lower frame rate, right? So it feels like a flipbook, like flip, 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 you know? Yeah. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that flipbooks are exactly 12 frames a second. <laughs> um, so according to my game, flipbook frame rate is 12 frames a second. Right. So I do, so, yeah, actually, I think if I go back to this code, you can see I, d I update the particle systems manually. Um, and I update them at my own specific update rate. So they update at 12 frames a second. So the, even the particles that I'm baking to a texture yeah. are sitting there, you know, and only move 12 times a second, despite okay. the game running at maybe 60 or 120 or whatever fancy frame rate the game's running at. Um, so that everything in the game is hand-drawn. I try to limit to uh, 12 frames per second. And that does have this kind of subtle effect, I think, that it all adds up where you, it kind of does feel like it's a hand-drawn thing, even though the game is really smooth. Yes, um, which it has to be. You know, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't want to yeah. play the game at 12 frames a no, second, no. I don't think. <laughs>